has been a joy to have Sister Cinda with us. I do love and appreciate her pastor, Brother Shortridge. I'm going to see if I can get him back here in Foley in this next calendar year. Just a tremendous man of God, and he's my friend. And uh, I know he'll be glad. I went about three hours or three and a half hours above them on this last trip. We drove, so they know how long of a trip that is. And, uh, with it being about three and a half hours away, Brother Shortridge said, man, you're a long ways away from me. I don't know if I'll get to make it or not. I said, well, I understand, Brother, but uh, only Shortridge I got to see was Allison came and seen us there <laughs> Thursday night. But I, I, it was good to see her. But uh, good to be back home. Good to be back in this pulpit this morning and feel the presence of God right here yes. among you. I was praying, uh, just believing this morning. And who knows, maybe they did without making the declaration. But just praying for somebody to get saved this morning. Felt like uh, God surely preached the right message to them for them to get saved. And uh, Brother Clint was telling me that he had a, a rehab service last night, got in late, and I said, man, the message I preached this morning would have been perfect for that service. He said, we preached a lot of the same stuff. So seen, uh, I don't know if it was a mother and a daughter or two sisters at the camp meet this past week get filled with the Holy Ghost. And, Brother Kenny Morris, on Thursday, he was all happy and giddy, and he told me, he said, I got word that my, two of my grandchildren, or he said, the only two grandchildren that had yet to be filled with the Holy Ghost, he said, both got filled with the Holy Ghost at youth camp this week. He said, I'm on cloud nine. So I'm glad the Lord's still in the saving business, yeah. filling business, yeah. healing business. Oh, yeah. He just hasn't changed one bit. That's right. Whatever you need him to do tonight, he's able to do exceeding abundantly above all we can ask or even think. I'm looking for him to come back. Amen. He came the first time as a babe in a manger. He's coming back again. He's a triumphant king of kings and lord of lords. We'll reign and rule with him. I'm longing for that day. So why, Brother Eddie? He said, because unto them that look for it shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. I want to be ready when he comes. Amen. We're going to read tonight out of 1 Peter chapter number 1. We'll begin reading with verse 13. We'll be praying for traveling mercy for Taylor tomorrow. She's heading back for three weeks and then coming back. So uh, we're praying God will uh, keep his hand on her as she travels. Thank God she's flying. Because after that ride I just took, I wouldn't want to wish that on nobody. 1 Peter chapter number 1, beginning with verse number 13. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fastening yourselves according to the former lust and your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. That word conversation is life or lifestyle. Because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. And if you call on the Father, who with respect of persons judgeth according to every man's, who without respect of persons judgeth according to every man's work past the time of your sojourning here in fear. I want to preach to you on our call to holiness. And when I speak of holiness, I'm talking about the our fruits unto holiness. Yeah. As we preach this morning, we can't have 
or we're not holy without him. But in him we're called unto holiness or Christ likeness. And I, I was, as I was preparing for this message, I, I, holiness is to the child of God what air is in your tires. It just ain't no good without it. It's what gas is or fuel in your tank. You're just not going to get far without it. And uh, it's what air conditioner is in, in the summertime here in South Alabama. You just don't want to be without it. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Pray with me tonight as we get ready to preach our call to holiness. Father, we thank you for your word tonight. I pray you'll speak to every heart. That you'll touch every life. You know every need in this place, Lord. And you're able to meet them all through Christ by his riches and glory. One of our greatest needs is to be like Jesus, to be found in his likeness, formed and fashioned after him in true Christ-like holiness. That is my desire, to be like Jesus, to hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. People were drawn to him. All people followed him. And Lord God, he did great things. John said so many things that all the books of the earth couldn't contain all the things that he did. God, and we're called to be like that. I pray you would make us like Jesus before we leave this house tonight as clay in the potter's hand. Mold us, conform us, shape us to his likeness, and we will be holy. We ask it in Christ's name. If you love him, would you say amen? amen. The part of being a Christian is growing to be like Christ. I was talking with Brother Trevor yesterday on the phone and I was trying my best to explain holiness and sanctification. Now, he didn't know I'd be preaching on it today, but I was, I was trying to explain it the best I could. And uh, to be Christ-like, you will never be more holy than you are the moment you're born again. What are you talking about? Because the blood is what sanctifies you from your sin unto God. The blood is what redeems you. That's right, right. And the spirit of Christ enters into you and you are at that time made holy. Amen. Holy unto God. Right. But it doesn't mean that as you grow in Christ and become more like him, where, where I'm not becoming more holy, I am becoming more Christ-like. If you can understand what I'm trying to say. A newborn babe's going to make the rapture just as quick as a man that's been saved 40 years. You understand that? And he's not going to be looked upon as a, as a second-rate citizen in heaven. He will be as holy as Christ is holy. But as we walk with Christ through the years, certainly I should be more like Jesus now than I was 27 years ago. Amen. Isn't that right? Yes. That's what it is to grow in Christ. In fact, the word Christian means a Christ one or a follower of Christ, one who is growing to be like Christ. And part of growing in Christ's likeness is also growing in our walk of holiness. Do you think of yourself as a holy person? Do you even want to think of yourself as a holy person? Or does that make you nervous? I want to talk with us about holiness tonight and hopefully help us understand what holiness is all about, who holiness is meant for, and what holiness is not, and how we can actually grow to be Christ-like or holy people, and why we would even have such a desire. Why would I want to be a holy man? Number one, God has called me to be holy. In our text tonight, he said, Be ye holy, for I am holy, saith the Lord. God wants you to be holy because he is holy. 
The first thing you need to understand about holiness is that we as God's children are called unto holiness. And holiness is not just something, or it's not something just for pastors or missionaries or church leaders. God calls all people unto holiness. Again, he said, as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of your life. Yeah. Be holy in Walmart. Yeah. Be holy in your living room. Yeah. Be holy in the church house. Yes. Be holy wherever you are good. in all manner of life. And then in verse 16, he tells us why. Because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. We are God's ambassadors. We are God's representatives. And God wants us to be holy because he's holy. So if I'm representing him, he don't want me being a fake. Come on, come on. Yeah, say it. Yeah. God is holy. He is pure. He is without sin. And he calls us to be like him. And you might say that's a pretty tall order, Brother Eddie, to be like Jesus. That is absolutely right. Yeah. And yet the scripture is clear just as God who calls you is holy, he calls you to be holy in all you do. Right. God says, be holy because I am holy. Right. And it's God's will that we are sanctified. Yeah. 1 Thessalonians 4 and 3 says, For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor, not in the lust of concupiscence, which means sexual desire or sensual pleasure, even as the Gentiles, which know not God, that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter, because that the Lord is the avenger of all such as we also have forewarned you and testified. For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. Right. People always wonder, what is God's will for my life? Well, first and foremost, if a person's lost, God's will for their life is to be saved. That's right. God's will for the born-again man is for him to be filled with the Holy Ghost, yes. to walk with God, to be full of and led by the Holy Ghost who will then lead you into a deeper and progressive walk of sanctification. If I only knew what God's will for my life was as a believer, I'd be sure to follow. 1 Thessalonians 4 and 3 says, it's God's will that you should be sanctified. In Christ. The word sanctified comes from the same word, holiness. It means to be consecrated or set apart. It's God's will that you should be set apart from the world unto God. He brought you out of darkness into his marvelous light. The Bible said that a man that is not saved, that lives under the condemnation of sin, does so because he hates the light yeah. and does not want to walk in the light lest his deeds be made manifest and he would be reproved of his sin. But the Bible went on to say if we walk in the light as he is in the light, then we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. That is walking in holiness. Amen. Amen. So it's God's will to set us apart from the world unto himself and that we should, according to Romans 12 and 1, present our bodies or offer our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable unto God. The word acceptable means pleasing, holy and pleasing to God as your reasonable service, or as one writer said, as your spiritual act of worship. You know, walking with God, set apart from the world, in obedience to God, 
full of the Holy Ghost, uh, progressing in sanctification. That is pleasing to God, and that is a life that worships God. As Christians, we no longer live for ourselves or our own sinful desires, but we're called to live for God, and that is holiness. Secondly, in Hebrews 12 and 14, without holiness, no one, no man right. will see the Lord. Yes. Let me give you one more verse that confirms that all Christians are called to holiness and not just a select few. Hebrews 12 and 14 says this, make every effort to live in peace with all men. Follow peace with all men and holiness right. without which no one will see the Lord. Without holiness, we can't see God. Right. Holiness is not an option for the Christian. It's required of it. Holiness then is a prerequisite for me to enter into heaven. Without holiness, no one sees the Lord. That's here and there. The Bible said that the kingdom of heaven it cometh not with observation, but it's in us. When you walk with God in holiness, scales fall off of your eyes and you see what other men don't see. Your ears are unstopped and you hear him speak clearly when other people don't hear him at all. That's the beauty of walking in holiness. Holiness is not what we may think it is. If holiness is that important, then we need to understand what holiness is and what holiness is not. And I'd like to take just a few moments tonight to, I don't know, unravel the mystery of the term holiness for some of you. A lot of people have misunderstandings of what holiness is all about. Holiness is not what some people think it is. Holiness does not mean acting strange somebody said we're peculiar people that word peculiar means to be set apart we're God's people it don't mean we're weird people somebody say thank you Jesus thank you Jesus I've been around a lot of people I walked away shaking my head and said, man, they're just weird. <laughs> and me and Kim have been around enough weird people in, in the ministry. Sometimes we say, maybe they're normal and we're weird. <laughs> I don't know, but I, I, I don't think that's the case. First of all, wholeness doesn't mean to act strange or weird because we're peculiar people. Some people get the idea that if they're holy, they have to walk around with a glazed look in their eye. They wear a white robe. And they speak in this holy, monotone type voice. But wholeness doesn't mean acting like a weirdo. Wholeness does mean you'll act differently in a number of areas than the world does for sure. You, wholeness does mean you will most likely stand out in a crowd because you are so unlike the world. Some people might even think that you're the strange one. They think it's strange if you don't want to get drunk. They think it's strange if when you get mad you don't kick and stomp and scream and cuss. They think it's strange if you don't experiment with drugs. They, some men would probably think it's strange if you're not attracted to the woman that's flirting though she's not your wife. People would think a young person is strange if they, if they hold on to their purity, their virginity because they're saving themselves like the word of God says they should. Some people may think it's strange because they're in sin and we're not. But that doesn't mean we're 
religious psychos, that we are weird people. Holiness is not separated from practical daily living. You ever heard the expression, he's so heavenly minded that he's no earthly good? I know that's a clever saying, but it makes it sound like if you focus on God too much that you won't be of any practical use to people down here. I've never met a man that is heavenly minded but is of no earthly good. If he's heavenly minded, he's one of the greatest men or she's one of the greatest women on earth. If they're full of the Holy Ghost, uh, walking in the Spirit, uh, then God is using them mightily. The world's a darker place without them. We should be heavenly minded. Colossians 3 and 2 says, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. But setting our mind on things above doesn't free us from our obligations to other people. No, on the contrary, setting our mind on things above frees us from the unhealthy attachments of earthly things or earthly pleasures that keeps you from loving and serving God and your neighbor as you should. Wholeness doesn't mean that you set off in the corner somewhere only thinking thoughts about God. You will spend time in your Bible and in prayer with God. But that time with God will send you back into the world. It'll make you a better daddy, a better husband, a better worker, a better neighbor, and a better Christian. Amen. It'll cause you to work hard at school or your job to do things here on earth that glorify and magnify God. Holiness will actually make you happier. (laughs) Blessed is the man who walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor sitteth in the seat of the scorn, nor standeth in the way of the sinner, but his delight is in the law of God. And he met in his law does he meditate day and night. The word blessed there means happy. Holiness can be equated to happiness. You can lay your head down on the pillow at night and not lay down in condemnation, not lay down worried about that one nagging, besetting sin that has a hold of you that you can't break free of. I mean, when when you walk in holiness, you're walking in peace and harmony with your neighbor. Because the Lord would deal with your heart and say, if your brother has ought against you, leave your gift at the altar. Go and make it right with your brother. Feels good to be at peace with God and to be at peace with each other. Amen. Hallelujah. There's nobody on this planet uh, that I'm at odds with, right. that I can't hug their neck, look them in the eye, and say genuinely, wholeheartedly, I love you. I'm for you and not against you. Amen. You know, I ain't always been able to do that. But as you walk with God and you grow in the Lord, he'll put more of his love in you. And to me, the love of God is equated to the holiness of God. Holiness will actually make you happier, better adjusted, more peaceful, more useful in this earth, not the other way around. Holiness is also not achieved through self-will or determination. You can't make yourself holy. A lot of people think that holiness is something that you're supposed to achieve as you strive to live for God. They think it's a matter of self-effort being applied against bad behavior or against bad habits. But holiness doesn't simply have to do with my behavior. It's about my nature. It's about my nature, my spirit. The Bible tells me that my nature is soiled by sin, stained with sin. I do not simply commit sinful acts 
when you commit sinful acts, it is saying something much deeper. I am a sinful person. In fact, the reason people commit sinful acts is because they are a sinner. Their nature has not been changed. And I know it's very confusing to watch people go to church, go to church, go to church, go to church. I have friends on social media, they go to church. They brag on the worship. Our pastor brought a wonderful word. And then the rest of the whole week, they're partying down. They're in a drunken stupor all week long, partying down at the beach. But on Sunday, they're going to be worshiping, talking about what a wonderful word. I want to tell you, you don't wear Jesus on Sunday like a lapel pin. And the name tag says Christian. Christian means a, a Christ one. One who is like Christ. If you think Jesus would do that, then do it. But if he wouldn't, you can't. I said, if he wouldn't do it, you can't. Somebody says, I'm a sinner saved by grace. That's an oxymoron. I was a sinner saved by grace. I used to be a sinner, but now I'm a child of God. I've been born again. To say I'm a sinner means that my nature hasn't been changed. But the Bible said we are made partakers of his divine nature. And we have escaped the corruption and the pollution in the world that is by sin. Because that individual is a sinner, they have a much bigger problem than just bad behavior or bad habits. Not only are they committing wrongful deeds, they think wrong thoughts. They have wrong desires. And they have to, they think, I have to clean up my act before I can get right with God. I need to clean out my heart. I need to break bad habits. I need to do better Things I need to straighten up my life. If you could do that, then Christ would never have hung upon the cross. Holiness cannot be achieved through self-will or determination. Holiness only comes in the form of a person, and that person is Jesus Christ. Oh, my God. This book is called the Holy Bible. I wonder why. Because in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Jesus was the Word of God that was made flesh and dwelt among us. Uh, this Bible is holy because it is a book about Jesus. Right. 66 collective books made up one volume Jesus Christ. Uh, when you understand this is a book about Jesus, this whole book is a revelation of Jesus Christ, uh, then it becomes the Holy Bible. Yeah. Hallelujah. Jesus is holy, and if I'm to be holy, I need to saturate myself in him. I need to swing the door of my heart open wide and let Jesus come in to abide. Holiness comes through Christ. How do we become holy? We've already seen how important holiness is. Without it, uh, no man will see the Lord. I'm not holy or can't make myself holy, so that means I am in big trouble without Jesus. Holiness is a desired state that is beyond uh, my earthly capabilities to attain, so how do I get there? Holiness comes through Christ. I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. Uh, no man can come unto God but by me. He's the door to the sheepfold. Yeah. If any man enters in, he said, he must enter in through me. And if he enters in through me, he will find pasture. That is, without Jesus, uh, we're hopeless. Yeah. Jesus yeah. died to make us holy. Ephesians 5 and 25 through 27 says, Husbands, love your wives 
even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Amen. That he might cleanse it by the washing of the water of the word and to present it unto himself a glorious church without spot or wrinkle or blemish. That means to be holy and blameless. Christ loved us, gave himself for us that he might wash us with the water by the word and present us unto himself a, a glorious church without spot or wrinkle or blemish to make us holy and blameless before God. Jesus knew that without holiness, uh, no one would be able to see the Lord. He knew we could not make ourselves holy, and he did for us what we could never do for ourselves. He suffered, died on the cross, uh, and gave Im imputed uh, or imparted uh, unto me his holiness. Yes. Amen. He took from me my sinful nature, took my sinful nature and placed it upon himself on the tree, died with it, nailed to him, buried it in the tomb, rose, yeah. oh, triumphant over sin, yeah. over that sinful nature, and then gave unto me his divine nature. Amen. Only Christ could do that. Yeah. It's his eternal gift unto, unto mankind. Cleanse us from our sin. To present us spotless, radiant, glorified, without blemish. We often talk about Jesus dying on the cross to forgive our sin. But Ephesians said he also died on the cross to give unto you holiness, spotlessness, glory, glorified perfection. Holiness is not the same as forgiveness. Forgiveness happens right away. As soon as you put your trust in Christ, you are forgiven. Yeah. The moment you believe in Christ, your sins are forgiven and you're in right standing with God. We preached about that woman weeping at his feet, washing his feet with tears, drying them with the hair of her head, breaking the alabaster box, anointing him. And kneeling at his feet, and he said, her sins, which were many, are, are, are forgiven because she loved much. Immediately we find forgiveness of sins. The Bible calls this justification. You're justified or declared innocent of all charges. Not guilty before God. Justification is a wonderful thing, but justification does not declare me to be holy. The moment I trust in Christ, I'm forgiven, but my nature still needs to be changed. Have you ever seen a person say, Lord, please forgive me of my sin. Please forgive me in big Crocodile tears drop off their cheek. They're feeling conviction. They need forgiveness. They are oh. repenting for their sins, uh, but they seemingly stop short. That's only half of repentance. Yeah. Right. Amen. They're repenting of their sins. I'm sorry I cheated. I'm sorry I stole. I'm sorry I lied. I'm sorry I went back uh, on my word. I'm sorry for doing that. Please forgive me. Make that better. Oh God, erase that blemish or stain off of my record. Uh, and they pray and somebody shakes their hand and says, oh man, God's forgiven you of your sin. Woo! Then they go out and sin again. It makes preachers beat themselves up bad. Yeah. I, I want to beat my head against a brick wall. And say, God, those tears were real. They, they cried a stain in the carpet. They were under such deep, deep-hearted, sincere conviction. That was real. Nothing fake about it. They weren't putting 
on. But true repentance doesn't stop uh, with forgiveness of sin. True repentance goes all the way to a change of nature. God, the problem is not only that I've cheated. The problem is uh, I'm a cheater at heart. And if you don't get down, if the axe is not laid to the root, and if you don't go all the way down to the core of my being and take the cheat out of me, I can't live right. God, the problem is not that I lied. The problem is I'm a liar. The problem is not that I failed. I'm a failure. And I need you to change me. We would all pray through and say, I'm not getting up until I'm delivered. I'm not getting up until I'm born again. I'm not getting up until I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus. You wouldn't have any problem with people coming back to church. It would now be their nature. It would be their delight. It would be their joy. I need to know God wants me to have a change of heart, a change of nature. And once that that change has taken place, just like you plant a seed in the ground. I'm born again, the Bible said, of the incorruptible seed of the Word of God. And that life begins to shoot up in me like a tender new green plant and I begin to grow. Bible calls this sanctification. Sanctification is the process by which I grow in holiness to become more like Christ. But I still can't do that in my own effort. Jesus died to make me holy and I must trust him to help me grow. To grow in grace and in the knowledge of my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This is where spiritual disciplines, reading our Bible, Spending time with God in prayer. Studying to show ourselves approved. Enjoying Christian fellowship. Serving others. Sharing your faith. All of that comes into play. It's only as we spend time with God and other believers that we began to grow in our sanctification. It's only as we ask God to perfect that change that has taken place in our life, that we begin to see our fruit unto holiness. Holiness is a fruit of being born again. Holiness is a fruit of walking with Jesus, abiding with Christ and his word abiding with you or in you. And holiness is a fruit of being full of he who is holy. It does take effort on our part. I understand that. As much as is in you, follow peace with all men and holiness. That takes effort on our part. But you must ultimately take all your effort and place them at the feet of Jesus and say, Lord, I can't even walk without you holding my hand. God, if it gets done, It'll be you. It'll be Christ in me, the hope of glory. And only when Christ has changed our heart will we find ourselves walking and growing in holiness. Growth in holiness is a lifelong process. Man, wouldn't it be nice if you lived for God a couple of years, you... I know we say we're saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost. Wouldn't it be nice if that meant we're sinless perfection? I mean, I'm just sinless perfection. I'm utterly holy. I'm as good as it gets and good as it's going to get. I hope I'm not as good as it's going to get. I I, want to close with this. Just one last point I want to make. Growth is a lifelong process. It's easy to get discouraged when we feel like we're not making progress. That's a good time to remember God's promise to us in Philippians 1 and 6, being confident of this, that he who began. What does began mean? 
if it wasn't a journey, he who has finished a good work in you, or he who has done a good work in you, you could say, hey, it's finished, it's done. I'm sinless perfection. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. The word perform means will carry it on unto completion until Jesus Christ appears and you are made like him. What is one of the most glorious things that's going to happen at the rapture? Brethren, it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We're going to be changed in a moment and in a twinkling of an eye. I'm going to put off uh, all that's imperfect, all that is mortal, all that is corruptible. It's going to be put off. I'm going to be swallowed up in victory. Even my corruptible body is going to be glorified. I see it through a glass darkly. I, there's the, I, I, I'm study. I'm trying to show myself a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Lord. But I see the mysteries of Christ through a glass darkly. Then yeah. I'm going to know as I'm known. Yeah. Yes. I'm going to know as Christ knows me. I'm going to know him. Because he knows everything there is to know about me. I'll know all there is to know about him. I'm going to be like him. I'm telling you, the universe is going to radiate the glory of Jesus Christ through the glorified church. Just like the sun, or just like the moon reflects the sun, we are going to radiate the glory of Christ. He is going to fill this universe with the glory of his son. Amen. It's not, that's not to say we should ever get lazy in our Christian growth. We should make every effort to be holy. But when you fail and you fall and you will fail, you will fall. I was talking to Brother Trevor yesterday about the difference between willful sin premeditated sin is not falling that's willful sin right. that means there's a real problem in your heart but when you're striving to live for God and you fail in the heat of the moment you do something that Christ would not have done. You react in a way that Christ would not have reacted. I, as a preacher of the gospel, have had to go back and say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Man, I, I just acted in a way that wasn't like Jesus. I don't know what to tell you, but I'm sorry. I've had people say, wow, I, I'm so grateful to hear you tell me that you're sorry. Preachers are human. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I've gotten angry before, reacted, and it was flesh and not Christ. Yeah. And I've had to say I'm sorry. You will fail. You'll fall. You take comfort in God's forgiveness and in also knowing that he is a long-suffering God has long patience for the fruit and the harvest of the earth. Yes. And he who began a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Thank Praise you. God. Curse if you help me, I'm going to finish. How do we respond to a message on holiness? Three ways. Real quick. Number one, we confess. We confess to God that without Him, holiness does not exist in our life. God, if there is a break in the link, if I'm not a man of prayer, if I'm not a man of the Word, if I'm not being faithful to the house of God where I'm going to 
be edified by fellowship and by the preaching of the word, by worship among the saints. If there's a break in the link somewhere, if I'm failing you in an area of my life, oh God, you have to confess that to God. You have to claim dependency upon him. You have to claim dependency upon him. Secondly, not it takes more than confession. True repentance, like we said, is a turning away from the very, not just the mistakes we made, but the very sin nature in our life. Tell God that grieves me as much as it grieves you. I hate it with a perfect hatred just like you hate it, and I don't want anything to do with it ever again. And oh God, it'll take you to eradicate it out of my life. Yeah. Then we have to commit ourselves. Commit ourselves anew to God and to his Christ. Yes. Maybe we've grown lazy in our walk. Now's the time to commit ourselves again to God and a life of holiness. I'm convinced that we'll never be truly happy in life until we are holy. Holiness is not just something for super saints or religious weird people. Holiness is a part of the Christian life, an everyday part. God is calling us as his people to be holy. We should be growing, advancing, progressing in holiness every day of our life. And if we're not, then tonight's a good night to say, Lord, Help me. Help me to walk with you in true holiness. School will be starting back up, young people. You need to make a recommitment. God amongst my peers, my classmates, and my teachers. Let them see a progression, not from sixth grade to seventh grade, not from seventh grade to eighth grade, or from ninth grade to twelfth grade, not just an educational progression. Let them see a spiritual progression in my life. I work beside, this may be your testimony, Lord, I work beside a man. I work beside a woman. They're ranked sinners. They know I go to church. There's a level of respect there that they have for me. But Lord, I want even them to see a progression in my life. I want them to notice uh, that I'm growing closer to Jesus uh, than I've ever been before. And if I lack in that department, I recommit myself to you, God, that I may grow in grace and in the knowledge of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Help us to grow, Lord. Make us holy because you're holy. I want to be like you, Lord. I want to be more like you than I've ever been. Would you meet me in this altar and pray, pray that prayer with me tonight?